All right. Well, it's good to be back here with you today. We are coming alive from Shoto Seventh-day Adventist Church in Shoto, Montana. Welcome to all of you who are joining us online, our congregation in Great Falls, those who are watching throughout the country and throughout the world. It's time to get into the Word of God, and as we do so, and as we normally do here, we rehearse a few habits before we open the Word. And our first habit is daily Bible, daily Bible reading. All right. I guess you stood in for your grandchildren because they usually would have shouted that real loudly, yeah. wouldn't they? All right. Daily Bible reading is habit number one. Let me see how many people are practicing habit number two. Now you've got to remember it and then figure out if you're practicing it. Habit number two is small groups. Small groups. How many in this group are in small groups? I see at least a handful. That's good. May your numbers increase. I suspect all of you are in the same small group. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Habit number three is? Share. Share it. Share the word of God. If God speaks to you in any sermon that is preached here, go online, find it, like it, and share it. Um, when God speaks to you, share what he has spoken to you. And our fourth and most recent habit is what? Does anyone recall? Call someone. Call someone. Be in touch with someone between Sabbaths and just connect with them. Um, pray for each other. Hang out with each other. Spend time with the body of Christ. All right. Well, we're going to get into the word. Guess what? Today starts a new sermon series. We have changed we have transitioned in our daily bible reading we are now in the book of acts. acts yeah we were in john last week we're in the book of acts this week and uh, our sermon series is entitled spiritual foundations that's what the book of acts is spiritual foundations for the church of christ for the christian church so we will continue in this series to cover material that we would have read uh, during the week. Now, last time that I preached to you, we were in the book of John. And my last sermon, we were looking at Jesus right before he went to the cross. We were in John chapter 16, and it was a time of turmoil for his disciples. Well, since then, if you've been going along in your one-year Bible, Jesus has gone to the cross, he's been raised from the dead, he has shown himself to his disciples as we closed out John. And as we get into the book of Acts, uh, we see a few things. It's been 40 days, according to Acts 1, 1 through 3, it's been 40 days since uh, the crucifixion. They are approaching a Jewish holiday called... Well, Passover, that was the crucifixion. Crucifixion happened at Passover. Pentecost happened seven weeks after Passover. So they were approaching Pentecost. All right. And uh, in the first chapter of Acts, which is where we're going to focus today, uh, we're told a very interesting interaction between Jesus and his followers. Uh, let's get the setting straight. The followers had been spotting Jesus from time to time since his resurrection. He would just show up whenever he wanted. Uh, maybe not when they wanted, but when he wanted, he would show up and have interaction with them. He met him when they were together in a room. He met him over by the, the Lake of Galilee, uh, where he had some uh, breakfast for them, some you know f fried fish or what whatever he did with it. But they had fish together by the Sea of Galilee, which is, by the way, a very good place to have fish together. And uh, right about this time, the disciples are ready for Jesus to do his thing. Well, what's his thing? Well, they want to see the kingdom restored to Israel. They want to see Jesus ascend on his throne. They want to see their king their Messiah rule over them. They want to be free of Roman oppression. So they are ready 
He has come, he has lived, he has taught, he has died, he has been raised, he has manifested. There's only one thing left to do. Come, Lord Jesus, take your throne. Let's take a look at the passage there in Acts chapter 4. Correction. Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he, that is Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Again, these men are from Galilee, but they are in Jerusalem because of the upcoming Feast of Pentecost. Uh, But to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, this appears to be a second coming together. Therefore, when they had come together, They asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons, which the father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witness. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Father, speak to our hearts today. As you have a word in this passage for us, let us hear it and let us be changed by it in Jesus' name. Amen. The disciples wanted God's kingdom to overtake the Roman Empire. That's what they were waiting for. They were ready for an end to the way things were, just like us. Uh, They wanted Jesus to come in his glory. I suspect there was something mighty Adventist about those disciples. But uh, if you think early Adventists were disappointed, imagine how disappointing it was for the disciples with the answer they got. Uh, They'd survived the worst weekend of their lives. They saw Jesus die. They were overjoyed at his resurrection. Now all they needed to happen was for Jesus to take the throne of Israel. They, like so many of us, were waiting for Jesus to come again. But they were told to wait. The end is not your concern, is what Jesus said to them. The end is not your sole focus. The end is not all there is. While no one was more clear about end times than Jesus was in the Bible, uh, he made it clear to his disciples that that should not be their priority. That should not be the priority of his followers. Let's see it again. He said to them, verse 7 and 8, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. While we're seeking the end, Jesus While they were seeking the end, Jesus was talking about power. While they wanted a way out, Jesus was telling them how to stay in the game. While they were ready to jettison the governing system, Jesus was instructing them how to face them. One more time, verse 8. But you shall receive power When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. It would take Holy Spirit power for the disciples to do what Jesus intended for them to do. According to Acts 2, they got that power 10 days later. Uh, The question for us to consider today, though, is where is that power? Where is the power? Are we as God's people today seeing Pentecost? 
Are we as God's people today seeing those kinds of miracles? Are we seeing the power of God at work around us as the norm? Where's the power? Does anybody here know what the Greek word for power is? I suspect there may be one or two. Does anyone know what the Greek word for power is? What? What, what the original language of that passage has for the word power? Dino. Dino, yes, you're on the right street. The Greek word is dunamis, but it's exactly the word from where we get dynamite. All right? So c consider the visual connection. Jesus promises power, and, and the Greek word for power is dynamite. He, he promises that there will be a force upon you dynamite something forceful something uh, able to make things happen to make things happen jesus promises power but where is it you will receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you where is it there's a connection in that verse between power and what it does Power in that verse is associated with what? Take a look at the verse closely. What is power in verse 8 associated with? It is associated with the Holy Spirit, but what does it do according to the verse? It says, you will be my, you will be what? Witness. Witnesses to me. May I propose to you that power comes with purpose power comes with purpose God's power has a purpose God does not just give us power for the sake of giving us power God doesn't pour out his Holy Spirit just so we can have his Holy Spirit there is a reason God pours his power on the church and that is to be witnesses the purpose of of God's power on his church is to be witnesses. In fact, let, let me make it more clear. The purpose of God's power is the glory of God. What is that? Well, let, let's take a look at how that manifested when Pentecost came around. Jump down to chapter 2. The text says, beginning verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one uh, sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now that's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool demonstration of God's fire. What if that happened here? If, if all of a sudden we felt the shaking, we, we, we felt the moving of God in this place, uh, and, and we saw tongues of fire or any other demonstration that God chose resting on us, how cool would that be? But that is not the whole story. The purpose for the power is not just a manifestation of power. Now, the text goes on and tells us in verse 5 through 8 how uh, there were people from every nation in the area, and it occurred that uh, the multitude came together when they heard all these things, and the text says they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Uh, then they were all amazed and marveled saying to one another, look, are these men, I'm sorry, are these who speak, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? That was God's power at work. The, uh, verse 12 says, they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this mean? And where does the power come in? What is the purpose of all of it? Jump down to verses 41 to 43. After uh, Peter teaches and instructs the crowd, the result of that day is those who gladly receive his word 
were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. My friends, that's the power of witness right there. The Holy Spirit manifested so that Christ's followers could be witness. He poured power on them, and immediately they began to witness. When God makes things happen, they can only be explained by his power. Do you, you realize how confusing it was for the people who were observing this? What is going on? They're wondering, why are we hearing these Galileans speak in these languages? Everybody knew these guys did not go to school, did not learn multiple languages. They, half of them probably didn't even know how to read. But they saw something amazing taking place. And let me ask us this. How many things are we involved in right now that only God can accomplish? How many things are we involved in that only God can accomplish? How many things are we engaged in that if God doesn't show up, it will be a total failure? In fact, it will be a, a, just a sheer embarrassment. For how many of our successes does God get all of the credit? See, my friends, the purpose of God's power is his glory. If he's not getting the glory, don't expect the power. If he's not going to get the glory, don't expect his power. Well, you say, well, what, what does it take? What does it take to demonstrate God's power? How can we demonstrate God's power? Let's spend just a few moments looking at that today. Let's go back to the beginning, verse 4 of chapter 1. And being assembled together with them, yes, we're going to read some verses a lot of times today. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Well, you jump down to verse 12, and what happens is verse 12, it's not on your screen, they return from, to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, where they were. It's not that far. It's basically across the valley. And, and uh, let's go to chapter 2 again. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, what was going on? They were all with one accord in one place. And that's where the power came down. That's where the manifestation happened. Now, you want to know what it takes to experience God's power. You want to know what it takes to demonstrate God's power. Well, my friends, we need to sit in the presence of God. If we want to have that power, we need to have that time in the presence of God. Uh, we need to practice just being with God. They had 10 days of it. Now, I know churches have had 40 days of prayer and and, and 90 days of this, and how many days of that? But how, how, how many times do we just stay with God for a week straight? Now, I'm not, I'm not going to reduce God to a formula. You know, we like to do that, right? If he did it in 10 days for, for them, then he should do it in 10 days for us. You know, God, God may do similar things, but he is seldom repetitious. It was only one crossing of the Red Sea. It was only one burning bush. Okay, God, God doesn't repeat himself in a formulaic way. But the principle remains. Spend the time with God. Maybe for some of us, a good week would be helpful. So for some of us, maybe it'll take a month. Or maybe we should just dedicate one or two hours every day to sit in the presence of God. What happens when we wait in God's presence? What happens when we sit there? Well, we develop a sense of God's desire. See, sitting in God's presence or praying 
as we look at praying, being in God's presence, is not about bringing your grocery list to God. Your Father in heaven knows what you need before you ask him, Jesus told us. It's not about bringing our requests to God. It's just about being with God. When we sit in his presence, we begin to understand his will. Yes, sometimes it takes. Uh, how, how many of you have, have sat in God's presence for two or three hours at a time? Is there one or two? You know, let me see a little hand here and there. Okay. Now, if, if you're like me, if you're better than, well, I suspect a lot of you have more mind control than I do. But if you're like me, it may take a little while to get all your crazy thoughts out of your head. Right? You, you may sit with God and you, you got to filter out some thoughts. Okay, got through that. Now let's focus. And, and it could take a good half hour, an hour just to get through your own thoughts so that you can get to God's thoughts. When we sit in God's presence, we begin to understand his will. When we sit in his presence, we begin to hear him. But don't expect to do that in a quick five-minute rush prayer before you head out the door to work. I, I, I want to take a look at what happened after the power came on the disciples. Now in Acts 3, we know the story of Peter and John as they're going to the temple to pray. Uh, there's a, a gentleman there who is lame, and we've been singing that song since we were children. And the man is asking for money. He's asking for alms. But, you know, thank God, Peter and John don't have any money. You know, we, we live in a time where we think money's the solution. If there's a problem, we throw money at it. If it doesn't work, we throw more money at it. Um, and if they, the apostles had money, well, the lame man would not have gotten a healing because they would have gotten, he would have gotten money instead. But, the man ha had been lame. He's, a, he's at least 40 years old. We don't know how long he had been lame, uh, but he was there. And because of the power, because of the time that Peter and John and the uh, disciples had spent in the presence of God, a healing took place. Now, I said, when we spend time in the presence of God, we begin to hear God. And, and I raised this question because... As I'm looking at it, I ask myself, was this the first time these guys saw this lame man? He's over 40 years old. Jerusalem's only so big. They must have bumped into him before. How many times had this man been in the same place before that day? In fact, if you, you, you want to ask some interesting questions, why hadn't Jesus already healed this guy. Jesus had been around there. Every time he went to Jerusalem, Jesus had some kind of encounter at the temple. You know, was he recently made lame? We don't know. What we do know is that Peter and John sensed that God wanted that man healed that day. They sensed what God wanted the text says, in fixing his eyes on him, John and Peter said, look at us. They had a sense of what God wanted, and they were able to go through with it. And, and take a look at verse 7. I find verse 7 interesting um, because generally, you know, you see Jesus doing miracles. Would you like to be healed? You know, uh, th there's, there's usually, not always, there are a couple miracles where that doesn't happen with Jesus, but there's usually some kind of input from the person being healed. Here in verse 7, it says, He, that is Peter, took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. In other words, Peter didn't wait for the guy to decide if he had enough faith to be healed. Peter grabbed the guy, said, look at us. He grabbed him, lifted him up, and the man was healed. What are the odds, however, that this was the only lame man in all of Jerusalem? Probably not, right? When we spend time in God's presence, we get to hear God. We understand his will. Uh, we, we discover what is on his heart. Sitting in God's presence informs us 
of who God wants to reach, what God wants to do, and when God wants to do it. Without the closeness to God, we have no sense of what God is wanting to do. So if we want to experience the power, we need to sit in God's presence. Uh, but, uh, but let's go back to verse 8 of chapter 1. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. You shall be witnesses to me. You see what happens when you learn things in one version and you change versions, right? You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So what's the next thing we need to experience if we're going to experience God's power? What's the next thing we need to do? It's in the passage. We need to be witnesses. Well, what does that mean? Be witnesses. I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean running around telling everyone that your church is better than theirs. Okay? It, it, it doesn't mean giving everyone you see a Bible track. It doesn't mean putting a thousand Sabbath bumper stickers on your car. It does mean living life in a way where God is seen as good for everything that happens to you. It does mean living a life where God looks good on you. It means that God gets the credit for the good in our lives. It means that whether we drink or eat, we do all to the glory of God. It means, it, it means that we speak of what God has done for us, to us, through us, toward us. It means that our lives tell the story of God's goodness. Let's jump to chapter 4. Chapter 4 of Acts, we've read it this week. What's, what's the conclusion here? So they called them. This is after the man was healed, and everybody in town is, is making a, a big to-do about this lame man has been healed. And, well, the authorities, the religious authorities, didn't care for it. So we read now. So they called them in and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Why? Because, well, they were asked, how do you do this? They said, by the power of Jesus. Now the authorities are saying, don't do that. Don't teach in the name of Jesus. What is their response? But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That's called witnessing right there. A witness speaks of what they have seen and heard. A witness speaks of their own experience. We speak of what we know. You know, there are some testimonies that are not admissible in court. Hearsay is not admissible. We can't say, well, Jane believes and, you know, we, 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 we can't say, Billy, Billy, no. What have you seen? What has been said to you? What have you heard? That is what a witness provides, firsthand accounts. I, I think Christianity has run into trouble when we see it as our task to convince everyone. It's not what God has called us to do. He has not called us to convince or convert. He has called us to be witnesses. Just tell them what I've done for you. We've said so far that power comes with purpose, and God's power has a purpose, and that is to bring glory to God, my friends. The purpose of the healing of the lame man was not to begin a healing ministry among the disciples. Uh, uh, that's probably something we would have done, right? If somebody was able to heal somebody, we'd probably start a healing ministry in church. Some churches thrive on that, and they get very large. The purpose of the healing was that more people would know Jesus as their Savior. That's the purpose for the power of God. One of our challenges today is that we tend to put the event above the purpose. We tend to highlight the miracle more than the gospel. We tend to celebrate the healing more than the God who brought it about. 
Uh, may I suggest to us, my friends, that we should let our witness be about God rather than what we accomplish. Let our witnesses be about the saving grace of Jesus rather than our methodology. Let our witness be about the love of God rather than our organizational success. We've said if we want to experience God's power, we need to sit in God's presence and be witnesses. Let's take a look at a third application here. We're in chapter 4. We, we start again at verse, uh, verse 7. And then when they had set him in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means we, he has been made well, let it be known to all. And to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Our last application today. If we're going to experience the power of God, we need to glorify God. The whole purpose for the miracle was the glory of God. Well... If we're going to see the power, let's glorify God. The purpose exceeded the object of the miracle. I want you to get that. The purpose of the miracle exceeded the object. What am I saying? God chose to, to heal that lame man, not so much for the lame man's sake. It was for God's sake. Sometimes we... we, we Tell God what we want. We, we, we petition God and we say, in Jesus' name. It's not in Jesus' name. It's in my name. It's my request. If it's in Jesus' name, then it's Jesus' request. Do you understand the difference? Tagging in Jesus' name at the end of your prayer does not make the prayer in Jesus' name. What does Jesus want? What does God want? Now, it's okay to bring your petitions to God. God clearly tells us to do that. Paul tells us to do that. Jesus tells us to do that. It's okay to bring our petitions to God. It's not only okay, it's recommended, it's necessary. Uh, it, it strengthens our lives. But don't confuse our request with God's desire. The purpose of the miracle exceeded the object of the miracle. Do you realize we don't even know that guy's name? We talk about the lame man. We don't even know his name. That's how insignificant he is to the story. It wasn't about him. Just like it's not about us, it was about God. It wasn't about Peter and John. It was about Jesus. It wasn't about the technique, the timing, the Bible text, or the training. It was about the power of the Holy Spirit, which is still at work with us today. Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. My friends, it was about the glory of God. Do our miracles glorify God? Do our answered prayers glorify God? Do our breakthroughs glorify God? Do our successes glorify God? Do our achievements glorify God? Do our lives glorify glorify God. We see the power of God when we practice his presence, when we live as his witnesses, and when we give him the glory. Then we see the power of God. Let me start the wrap up here. A couple weeks ago, I was traveling all of Montana with our school kids here at Shoto. And uh, anybody remember the sermon that day? Let, let me help you out, because you, you're trying to remember. You're trying to remember. Uh, the, the point of the sermon was, we can see Jesus. Now do you remember it? Now, now you remember it? Do you, do you remember the, the illustration with the safari, the picture of the safari? And the point was made that what? We see what we're looking for, right? Can we throw that picture back up there? Is it up there? Can we give it? There it is. There's the picture. And I think we were told to count the zebras in that picture, right? You recall that? For those that watch the sermon, the point was, look at the picture and uh, tell me how many zebras there was. Okay, let's take that picture down. Let's go to the next slide. 
All right. So here's a question for you. How many antelopes were in that picture? What, what, what antelope? Well, specifically the Jim, Jim Spock antelope. There, that guy. How, ma how many of those were in the picture? Well, if you... <laughs> without your glasses? If you had counted six, your answer would have been right. But you weren't looking for them, were you? All right? My friends, here, here's today's good news. Here's today's good news. I had to recycle that illustration because it was powerful then. I hope it still works now. But here, here's the good news. When we seek God's glory, we'll see God's power. That's the good news. When, when we seek God's glory, we will see God's power. When our efforts seek God's glory, we will see him do things we had not seen before. When our ministries seek God's glory, we will experience the power. When our churches seek God's glory, we will experience the power. When our lives seek God's glory, we will experience the power. To the extent that we seek God's glory, to that extent, we will see the power. But you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Jesus said, and you will be my witness. My friends, no one is attracted to a powerless church. Just going to let that sit in the air for a second. No one is attracted to a powerless church. No one is attracted to a powerless faith. No one is attracted to a powerless belief system. Ah, but when Jesus is glorified in our lives, people notice. When God is praised through our existence, people notice. When the Holy Spirit's power works through us, people pay attention. So let's leave today promising to do this. My friends, let's seek God's glory. Let's pursue God's purposes. Let's embrace God's priorities. Let's follow God's agenda. Let's bring God the praise. Let's seek God's glory.